We don't know. Hey, um, I'm not going to preach today. I think it'd be better just to say I'm going to ramble. Is that okay? I'm just going to ramble. Um, you know, I, I like to put some time in and, and to sort of, you know, work out what I'm going to share. And, you know, we have themes that we've been following at different times and that. But funny thing happened this week. It was Christmas and, um, and New Year's. It all sort of jammed in didn't it, in that time. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've been sort of enjoying some time with friends and family and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I just wasn't able to sort of articulate what it was that I was sort of wanting to, to, to um, share this morning. So I came in early, which I do every Sunday morning. I'll come in here around about seven o'clock on a Sunday morning just to pray and to walk around and, um, you know, have a look at what I'm going to share. And when I came in this morning, I... I Usually, I'll, you know, we, we like to pray over the chairs, and we'll sometimes pray over the seats you're sitting in, and things like that. And and because we're expecting something to happen, I, I it, when we gather here, I, I I approach Sunday morning when I come to, to to this what we call church gathering. It's not a church gathering; it's a gathering. You're the church, people of the church, not a building. But when we get together. Um, I walk in this building and and gather with you guys or any other sort of Christian gathering I go to with a different kind of headspace, I guess, than than I do when I go. So I was the president for 11 years at Bowen Touch Association. I'm the vice president now. I'm taking a step back. But but we have committee meetings every month. And when I go to a committee meeting, I go there with a certain headspace. And that headspace is very different to the kind of headspace I come hear from. When I go to that meeting, I'm expecting to hear... What's going on with the touch football competition? I'm expecting to hear from people that are, what's happening with our referees? How are our coaches doing? What's happening with our representative players? I'm expecting all that kind of stuff when I go to that sort of a meeting. But when I come to a meeting like this, I'm expecting something else. I'm expecting to actually hear from God. Is anyone else here? When you gather, you, you gather expecting, you come here with a heart that's open and an ear that's open, and you're expecting that, okay, God, if you really are there, if you're, some, if you're more than Casper the Friendly Ghost, which many of us believe he is, if you're more than Casper the Friendly Ghost and you are real, then there's got to be some sense in which I can expect a real tangible interaction with you, some sense in which if you can speak world into existence, if the writers of these ancient documents claim to have heard from you, and there are stories in there of you speaking to people and people listening and responding, and of the 2.34 billion people that call themselves Christians on planet Earth today, they're all giving out testimonies of feeling that God spoke to them and led them and interacted with them, then isn't it fair and right that when I come to something like this, surrounded by, by mostly people of like mind, and committing myself to fully focus in on God, and that's what we do with worship, it's not just about singing songs, it's about focusing because the world has stolen my attention all week. It's pulling me left and pulling me right, and we're thinking about all kinds of things. And when we come in here and these guys get up and, and use their gifts, and, and they don't point us to themselves, they're not saying, Look at me, they're saying, Look at the one we're singing about. And so, as we fix our focus on Him, it's only fair and reasonable to expect that somewhere in that process, there's the potential for some kind of interaction between the Creator God and this little finite being called me. When I come to something like this, I'm coming with a sense of expectancy that, that something's going to happen, that, that God's gonna, God wants to speak to me. How many of you know God wants to speak to you? He actually wants to speak to you, He has spoken to you. In times past. So I think the problem with the voice of God is not that we don't hear from God. Most of us don't know how to discern which one is God and which one's not. That's the real problem. I believe God is always speaking. I look back on my life and I can see where God was speaking to me when I wasn't even following God. But I didn't know what God's voice sounded like because I didn't know who Jesus was and I hadn't looked at Jesus. Jesus is the express, the visible image of the invisible God. I hadn't gotten into the words of Jesus. I didn't understand who Jesus was or God was, so I didn't really recognize his voice. But now that I'm journeying with God, now I discern his voice a lot more easily. So when I come to a gathering like this, you know, I'm actually expecting to hear from God. I come with expectation. When I come to a meeting like this, I've got problems and situations. I walk in here and I'm thinking, okay, God, my ears are open uh, because I think you as a loving father want to help me in some of those situations and circumstances that I find myself in. So I come in here with a different kind of headspace than I would if I go to a Lions Club meeting or a, or a, a you know, whatever other sort of club meeting I go to. I'm specifically coming here very focused on God, going, God, you've got something that you want to say. I know that you do. And so I'm 
in this place with a sense of expectation. I'm expecting something. And I came in here this morning and I just want to share three words that popped into my head when I came in here this morning. And I walked up the front here and, and um, you know, anyone ever do things when they're alone that they would never do with other people? Yeah, my wife does. Anyone, anyone, anyone Paul Worth, you ever get a hairbrush and sing in the shower when no one's watching? I'm not sure if I believe you, but uh, they're, 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 how, many, how many of you, how many of you dance, you know, maybe with your, your, your partner, whatever, you'll dance really silly and stuff, but when other people are around, you would never be seen doing that. You would just never be seen to be dancing. I'm just using personal examples. Um, there, there are things that we do in, in, in the presence of other people uh, when we're alone that we wouldn't do in the presence of other people. And, and so sometimes, I'll just let you know what I do. Sometimes I sneak in this building here and I stand here and I preach to nobody. I do, I go and I'll preach as if there's a thousand people in here and it's just a, a way that I, I find that I connect with God when I sort of get in that mode and things start to flow and so on. And this morning I came in and I walked up here and I thought, okay, God, I'm trying to, to, to really articulate what I want to say. And three words popped into my head and I just want to spend a little bit of time and talk about those three words and just throw some things out at you. Be, because I think, I, I think 2022 is going to be a good year. I think God wants us to raise our level of expectation in 2022. I think we've been through a season as a church, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's, that's okay. I'm hoping that you, you'll get something out of this as well in your own life, because I'm sure you can relate. The last couple of years, there's been like this blanket thrown over us, and, and the expectation, the dreams, the hopes, the stuff we were believing for, it was kind of, has been contained, and it's almost like we've been, some people I talk to, it's like they've had the, the, the faith beat out of them. Now, we still believe in Jesus, yeah, we still believe in God, but, you know, we just can't wait to make it to heaven. We just can't wait to get through this and one day we'll be with Jesus in heaven and everything will be okay. And that's 100% true. But how many of you know, some of you got a lot of living to do down here between now and then. Some of us have got a lot of time down here to be doing stuff. Um, Joshua chapter 18, I, I just want to... I want to read a little story, a couple of verses out of Joshua chapter 18. I'm going to try to read them. I don't have my glasses on. Um, that's a hint for my wife if she'd like to go up the back there in the drawer and grab my glasses from there. She can. Or, no, it was not preempted. I didn't tell her to do this before. My mistake. I'm not blaming. And she's going to stop and say hello to friends on the way. What a <laughs> silly thing. I should have got somebody else to do it. I'll stand back here and I'll see if I can do it. Joshua chapter 18. It says, the whole assembly, I just feel like God's, uh, just be quiet, let's just wait in the presence of God for a second. Here's my glasses, Jackie. Shh, close your eyes, let's pray. Okay. Thank you, darling. Joshua 18. Verse 1 to 3, and here's what it says. It says, The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. And the country was brought under their control. So for those of you that don't know, Israel are in captivity in Egypt for hundreds of years. And along comes this dude called Moses. And you might know the story of Moses, you might not. But Moses is the one that God says, God says to Moses, go in there, shirt front Pharaoh, and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. It's time for the Jews to be released from bondage in Egypt and stop being your slaves. As you can imagine, if a, a, a sheep herder who's out in the hills for 40 years like Moses, he had a bit of an Egyptian background and did something wrong and disappeared from Egypt for 40 years, comes back into town and then shirt fronts Pharaoh and says, let my people go. It didn't go down really well. And so what ends up happening through a series of miraculous events, eventually Pharaoh lets them go. And so Israel leave Egypt and they take with them all the gold and jewelry. God just hammers the, the, the Egyptians, because they won't let God, uh, God's people go. So God hammers them. In the end, they walk out, and then it begins this journey where they start, uh, there's a promised land that they're meant to go into. So they're leaving this place of captivity. There's another place that God has for them to go to. But on the way, they start whinging and grumbling and complaining and arguing. And instead of being excited and looking at what God had done to get them out of hundreds of years of bondage and slavery, uh, how quickly they forgot how good God was. And they began to grumble and whinge and complain. So that whole generation, God said, I'm sick to death of your whinging. Here's what's going to happen. You guys are going to wander around in a circle for 40 years until this whole generation are dead. And hopefully your children will do a better job than you. Hopefully your children won't grumble and complain. They'll grow up, they'll respect me, they'll listen to me, and they'll do what I'm asking them to do. 
And so that generation dies and the younger generation come up. Moses dies and Joshua, this guy Joshua, becomes the new leader. Now, Moses was a bit of a maintenance man. All he did was, it says that, that, that while they wandered around for 40 years, God made sure their sandals didn't wear out and he made sure every day a bit of food fell from the sky. He was like a maintenance man. Whereas Joshua was not a maintenance man. Joshua's job was not to maintain where they were, but to take them forward into something new that they hadn't experienced before in God. This is what Joshua was about. So Joshua takes them into what, the, what these ancient writers call the promised land. The, the, the thing that God had said to them, that he had the, for them, the thing that God wanted to give them, Joshua took them into this place called the promised land. Of course, they go in there, they fight a few battles, they're warring, they're getting blood on their hands and sweat on their brow and dirt on their knees and they're battling, battling, battling away. And by the time we get to Joshua 18, they've won a few battles, they've had a, a, a few victories and so on, but something interesting happens in Joshua 18. It says, The whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh, they set up the tent of meeting there. The country was brought under their control, but there were still seven tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So in other words, the job wasn't fully done. They hadn't actually walked into everything they were called to walk into. They'd gone part way, but then something happened and they stopped. Now, we don't know what happened, but we can have a guess that, that maybe they were just tired. Maybe they were just tired. I mean, these guys had won some battles. They'd fought some great kings. They'd overcome. They'd done some pretty weird and pretty outrageous, amazing stuff. They'd been following God. Maybe they were just tired. Maybe they were sick of fighting. Maybe they were sick of fighting because who likes to fight? Who wants their whole life every day to be a battle, a fight? Maybe they were sick to death of fighting. Maybe they just felt like, God, that's enough. I just want to have a break. Maybe they were sick of wandering. Maybe they just got sick of walking around and around. We come into this place. We take this city. What a great city. There's, there's, there, we could, there's potential here, but we've got to move on to the next one. And we've got to move on to the next one. And move on. Maybe they were just sick of wandering. We don't know why. But what we do know is by the time we get to Joshua 18, they've pitched their tent and they've stopped. They've just stopped. And you know what? I feel like when I was reading that this morning, that, that there's a little bit of a picture of that of maybe where some of us are at in terms of God through our whole battle and all the stuff that's gone on in the last couple of years. How many of you know that it didn't take long before the media to try to steal 2022 away from us already? Hey? It did not take long before the reports were out again, thousands of this and hundreds of that and thousands of blah, 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 blah. And straight away, I, I could feel there was this, this, this wind. Uh, uh, yeah, everyone started out thinking 2022, this wind of change, it's going to be different. And then all of a sudden, all you start hearing in the media and seeing on the news and so on, and I could tell straight away, oh, I just feel like there's this culture around us that's going, uh, 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 let's just pull it all back on in. It's going to be same old again, same thing. And that wind of change, they're trying to stop it and trying to get everybody to lower their expectation for 2022. All we've got to do is let's just expect more of what we've had. But I feel like God's saying, I don't want you to expect more of what you've had. I want you to start to expect something else because I've got something else for you to begin to walk into. But I'm not just going to hand it to you. I don't just give it to you. You've got to play your part in that. You've got to play your part in that. I understand how tired these guys were. I've never been so tired in my life. Let me be brutally honest with you. I've never been this tired in 49 years of human existence, I don't think I've ever been this tired. And we raised four small children. <laughs> and we've only got one at home now. But I've never felt more tired. And it's not the physical stuff, it's the mental stuff that tires me out. I can, I can work with my hands and run all day and it energizes me, but it's the mental gymnastics that go on that actually wear me down and make me tired. So I'm, I've never been as tired as what I am right now. But there's an excitement and an expectancy in me where I feel like God's saying, you know what, it, it, it's, it's okay, what's gone on has gone on, but what I want you to do in 2022 is I want you to pick yourself back up. I, I don't want you to just stay and pitch your tent and stay in that place. I want you to pick yourself back up. And Joshua makes this statement in verse 3. Joshua then turns to the Israelites and he says this, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land the Lord your God has given to you? How long will you wait? And that's what I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying is how long will you wait? How much longer do you want to sit and stay in the same place before you stand up and start moving forward again? How much longer are you going to just sit in the same place? 
How much longer are you going to allow the residual of the last two years to drag on and flow on? At what point are you going to say, I've had enough, I'm going to stand up, and it's actually time now to start looking forward instead of looking back. It's time to start moving forward instead of just sitting down in the place where you are. Maybe a place that's very comfortable, maybe a place that's become very familiar in the last couple of years, but it's time to stir ourselves back up. Let faith and expectancy rise again and begin to move forward into all that God has for you and all that God has for me. The three words that I felt like God spoke to me this morning when I stood here were these. They were consistency plus expectancy equals possibility. Now, I'm not one for pithy little sayings, all right? It's not my scene. But I thought that was pretty cool. I thought it was pretty cool. I thought consistency plus expectancy equals possibility. And I thought, you know what? Possibility, that's a great word. I want 2022 to be a year of possibility. I want 2022 to be a year where I'm actually expecting things to be different. You know, there's nothing supernatural or magical about a calendar change. How many of you know that? The air I breathe, December 31, is the same air I'm breathing, January 1. The same sun that came up December 31 is the same sun that came up January 1. The same car I drove December 31 is the same car that I drove January 1. The same fridge you got my milk out of on December 31 is the same fridge you get me milk out of January 1. There's nothing supernatural about a date change. It's nothing external that's going to bring about the change, but it's going to have to be something on the inside of me. If I want 2022 to be different, I can't be looking out there at everything else hoping the world will change around me. Maybe the world won't change, but I'm going to change. I've got to make some decisions inside of me that I want to build expectancy. I'm not going to sit back and look around and wait for something to happen to spark my faith. I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose to press into God and I'm going to choose to look for opportunities to build my faith and to grow my faith and to reconnect my expectancy with what God says, not what culture says or what the world says anymore. Don't you get sick and tired of of following a God that we know is a supernatural God. We know that God can do amazing things. Many of you in this room have experienced the amazing things of God, but yet... It's almost like in 2021, we got to this point where, where we had made a God. The world is trying to create a God in its own image. The Bible tells us that man is created in the image of God. We're created in his image. But, but, but I feel like things happen and change in culture. And what we do, what, we're, what we've got to be careful not to do is every time something changes in culture and the world around us, we want to change God to fit that. We want to bend and twist God a little more to fit that. So culture is, 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 so there's a clash between culture and God. So what we do is we go, okay, well, culture's not going to change, so let's change God to fit into culture. And before you know it, we get further and further and further and further and further away from the God that this ancient Bible, these ancient documents talk about. We get further and further away from that God. And is it any wonder no one has expectation anymore when you think about who God is today? Where's the expectation? Matter of fact, I think the role's been reversed. It's almost like we've become God and he's subservient to us. Well, I think it's time that we shook ourselves out of that. It's time we got back to what these ancient writers said. It's time that we stirred up in our hearts again that God, you know, the, the God of the universe wants to do things. He wants to speak to you. He does. I don't know how long it's been since you feel like you've discerned his voice, but he wants to speak to you. The God of the universe wants to do things in your life. The God of the universe wants to bring healing into your heart, healing into your spirit, healing into your life. The God of the universe wants to bring restoration to those bits that are cracked and broken. The God of the universe wants to take you forward. He doesn't want you just sitting and staying in the one place. Matter of fact, that's part of the prophetic call of this particular church. That's why we're called Arise. We're not called sit down and stay there. Huh? Welcome to sit down and stay there. Who wants to go to sit down and stay there? I don't want to sit where I am. I don't want to stay where I am. I want to go forward. I want to go upward. I want to grow more in my understanding of God. I want to grow in faith. I want to become more of the person he wants me to be, the person he envisions me to be, the person he sees me to be. A little bit like Gideon. Everyone remember the story of Gideon in Judges when God comes to Gideon and Gideon's threshing wheat in the wine press. And a wine press, for those who don't know, is a hole in the ground. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You thresh it up and you, and you put a pitchfork in, you throw it in the air and the Wind blows the bad chaff away and the good stuff. This this is what you do. But he's in a hole in the ground because he's afraid because there's a culture out there that are coming against his culture. They're coming against his people. And every time they pop their heads up, culture comes in and steals away from them that which is theirs. And so he's in a hole in the ground threshing wood. And this angel appears to him and an angel looks at him and says, Hey, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon's there going... I'm in a hole in the ground threshing wheat, hiding out for fear of my life. I'm freaking here. Mighty man of valor, what are you talking about? And then, of course, Gideon goes through, you can't use me, God, I'm the least of the least. Gideon would have made a good Aussie, wouldn't he? 
The first thing he does when God appears to him is he whinges about something. Has a whinge. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. But here's the thing. That's how Gideon saw himself. But God saw Gideon differently, didn't he? God looked at him and said, I don't care what you see. I don't care what everyone around you sees. I see greatness in you. I see potential in you. I see plans and purposes that I fashioned and created you for. And it's time that you stood back up and started believing that, started listening to me and started moving forward with my plans and my agenda for your life. How many of you know what a, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a hammer's for? My wife doesn't know what a hammer's for. That's a lie. She thinks a hammer is what you put a screw in a plasterboard wall with. And I keep trying to tell her it's not. That's a drill. You know what a hammer's for? You bang nails in. But what do you think happened? Do you think that they just suddenly someone created a hammer? We just made a hammer. What about a shovel? Somebody just created a shovel. Somebody got a piece of metal and they batted it flat, curved it a little bit, stuck it on the end of a piece of wood and picked it up and went, gee, that thing looks really, really good. What can we do with that? Or do you think somebody one day went, you know what, I'm sick to death of digging dirt out with my hands and having to shovel dirt from here to there with me. What can I make that's going to work to do that at intended end that's going to achieve that goal? So they went away, they got a piece of steel, they made it skinny, they belted it down, curved it, put it on a piece of wood and stuck it in the ground. Wow, that makes the job so much easier. You see, the shovel wasn't, wasn't, the shovel was made for an intended specific purpose, wasn't it? It was created for a purpose. The purpose existed before the shovel existed, amen? The purpose was there before the shovel was there. That's the mother of all invention is purpose. We need, when there's a purpose for something, then we make something to fulfill that purpose. Well, that's exactly what God has done with you and me as well, is that the purpose came before the creation. There's a purpose for your life. There's something that God has for you. There's something that God has fashioned you for, created you for, purpose built you for. You're a custom built object, whether you like it or not. You're custom built. You're made with intention in mind. You're made because God looked down and said, in 2022, there's going to be things I want to do on planet Earth. In 2022, there's going to be uh, ends I want to achieve. There's going to be glory I want to bring about for myself, for God, for himself. And he says, I have been fashioning and making certain implements because I'm going to use them because the purpose already exists. Now, what I need you to do is get on board with the fact that there is a purpose for you. Start listening, start looking, and start allowing yourself to be led so I can start to use you for the very purpose for which you were created. You're not random chance. But in order for you to live like that, you've got to have expectancy. You've got to have expectancy in your life. And if you don't have expectancy, then you'll miss it. I wonder how many things we miss every day. Anyone ever want to buy a yellow mini? Anyone ever want to buy a yellow mini? No, neither I. What a stupid car. But if you wanted to buy a yellow Mini, how many of you ever experienced this? You want to buy a particular car. You've never seen that car. Your partner, your kids have never seen that car in the history of mankind. All of a sudden, you come home one day. You say, I want to buy a yellow Mini. Here's a brochure and so on. Then you go for a drive and all of a sudden, you are seeing yellow Minis everywhere. Anyone ever experienced that? That thing that you didn't even know existed, all of a sudden, you realise everyone on planet Earth's got one of those things. How did I not see it before? You weren't looking for it. Why could because you weren't in a place of expectancy. But when we put ourselves in a place of expectancy, we begin to see things. We begin to experience things. We begin to notice things. We begin to find ourselves getting on board with whatever it is that God has for your life. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, God says this to Joshua, and I think it links these three things together. He says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. What is that? He's talking about consistency. So he's saying to Joshua, if you meditate on my word day and night, in other words, be consistent. Be consistent. If you'll develop consistency in your life. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, why are you developing consistency? So that you might be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. So there's the expectation. The the expectation is, Joshua, I want you to expect to be prosperous and successful. But the way you're going to get to that expected end is I need you to develop consistency in your life. So you're not going to just get there just because you want to. You're not going to just get there because I said that I've got it for you. You're going to get there because you play your part and you get a bit of consistency in your life. And when you get consistency, and here's the thing, it's hard to be consistent with anything if you don't have expectation. Isn't that right? If you don't expect that that green bean and that half a carrot is going to make you healthy, you won't consistently eat it. But if you actually have an expectation that eating one green bean and a carrot over a hamburger every night is going to get you healthy and that's what you're expecting, then you'll do it. But if you don't have an expectation, it's hard to have consistency in life because we're only really consistent when we believe that we're going to get a certain end or an end result or we have an expectancy of a particular outcome. When we have expectancy of an outcome, 
we find ourselves in a place where we feel like we can be more consistent. You know why a lot of people aren't consistent in their time with God? They've got no expectation of an outcome. It's just a religious ritual that we go through. When, you know why most people aren't consistent in their time in the Word of God? It's not that you don't have time. You've got the same amount of time that people have had since the day God created planet Earth. And it's not that you're living in a world that's more time poor. No generation's ever had more time. You're just more distracted. Everything you do now is quicker than what your great, 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 great grandparents did it. It used to take them 40 minutes to boil water. It takes you three. It used to take them six hours to prepare a roast dinner. You put it in a microwave, press a button, you've got it in, you know. We've got all kinds of things. They used to have to walk to church and take 45 minutes. You're there in three because you jump in a car or on your motorbike. Everything about life today is quicker than it's ever been. We are not time poor. That's a fallacy. But we are more distracted, aren't we? These things and your mobile phones, all that stuff, we are, we're the most distracted generation ever. But why do we not find consistency in the Word of God? I don't believe it's because of any of those things. I believe it's because deep down inside, we have no expectation that it's going to benefit us. We don't have an expectation that consistent time in the Word of God is going to shape us. It's going to mold us. It's going to change us. It's going to give us uh, uh, insight into who God is and how He sees us and how He sees the world. We, we, we literally, many people just think it, we pick it up and we read it like we're reading Fishing Australia or Rugby League Week or whatever magazine subscription you might read that you just pick up whenever you feel like it. But yet the Word of God is living and active, it says in Hebrew. It's living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Divides our soul, spirit, joints, marrow, judges the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. There's something supernatural about the Word of God. It's different to any other book you'll ever pick up and you'll ever read. But why aren't we consistent? probably, possibly, we don't believe that there's going to be any expected outcome from it. So why would I consistently give myself to anything It's not going to produce nothing positive in my life? Well, I believe that it does. Consistent prayer. Many people aren't, we're not consistent in prayer. Why? Bottom line, again, if we're brutally honest, we just don't have any expectation of some sort of an outcome. Why would we consistently pray? I prayed once and it didn't happen. Why would I waste my time again? It's interesting, in, in Matthew 7, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, you know, the, you know teach us to pray. And, and he, he says, our Father in heaven, we've gone through this, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your and he says this, give us this day our daily bread. Isn't that an interesting thing, to pray? He didn't say, give us the bread we need for the rest of the week so we don't have to come back and pray again tomorrow. <laughs> he said, give us this day our daily bread. What's the insinuation? Well, I want you to come back tomorrow. And I want you to say, can you give us this day our daily bread? I want you to come back the next day and say, can you give us this day our daily bread? And I want you to come back the next day and say, could you give us this day our daily bread? Let's get some consistency going here because if you're consistent, things change. If you develop consistency in your spiritual disciplines and consistency in your spiritual life, then you'll begin to experience movement in the direction that God wants you to go. You'll find yourself becoming the person he wants you to become. You'll find yourself beginning to walk into the things that he wants you to walk into. But we won't develop consistency if we don't have an expectancy. Why would I be consistent in something that won't produce anything positive for me? How much expectation do you have about 2022? What's your expectancy? Are you expecting God? Are you expecting to end 2022 the same way you started it? Or are you expecting to be different? Are you expecting to, to be able to discern the voice of God better at the end of this year than you do now? Are you expecting to be able to answer those questions? You know those questions that your friends ask you about God and you just stare blankly in the sky and go, I don't really know, I'll go and ask the pastor. When you've got access to some of the answers here in the Word of God, you could get into this. And you could know how to answer that question next time. Somebody asks you or somebody comes to you with that concern or whatever. Are you going to step out more in faith? You know, some of you, it's, 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 it's awkward and weird maybe to express yourself in worship. Maybe it's, it's really hard to do that. You want to do it, but it's really, really hard. You're self-conscious, embarrassed or whatever, and that's fine. Maybe some people, you're just not expressive and that's cool. But there are people here and you probably would be, but, 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 but you're not, but you want to. Well, you know what? It's only going to change by consistently doing something a little bit different. Maybe do this. Maybe just put a finger out. You can't put a whole hand out. Just start with a finger or something. Maybe you raise a finger to God. Whatever it is that you do. Maybe just bend the knee a little bit in worship like that. You know, praise Jesus. But the more consistently you do these things, then the more that, that change takes place in our lives. 
expectancy. But we'll never be consistent if we don't have expectancy in our life. That's the bottom line. What sort of expectation do you actually have? What sort of expectation do you have in terms of your, your relationship with God, what he wants to do in you and through you in 2022? I, 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 we did a, a, what do you call it? A, a karaoke. Yeah, we did karaoke the other night at our house. Remember I was telling you about those things you would never do in front of other people? Well, we did that the other night in our house. We did karaoke. And uh, one of the songs that we picked uh, for the girls to sing was the Taylor Swift song. You know that Taylor Swift song? Shake it off. Shake you know, Don't look at me like you don't know the song. You're a proud bunch. Taylor Swift song, shake it, come on, who knows, you girls would know it, wouldn't you, you know, Daniel knows it, shake it off, Sh- shake it off, you know, I feel like we've just got to shake off 2020 and 2021, it hasn't all been bad, but there's like this spiritual residue that you know, I can already sense is trying to creep forward into 2022, God is a good God, amen, he's a God of life, he's a God of joy, he's a God that, that, that has plans and purposes and future and good things stored up for us, that's the God that we serve and, and, and we don't want to carry all that residue over from last year, we, we, want to, we want to raise our level of expectation, we want to live with expectancy that the God of the universe actually wants to interact with you, he loves you, he loves you, you're important to him, you really are. I know you may not feel that, but I'm telling you, according to these ancient writers, you are important to God. He values you and he loves you and he has good things in store for you. For those of you that do know God, consistency. Are you going to develop consistency in your world this year? How many of you, uh, and I don't want to show of hands, but I'll guarantee you there are many people in this room and you started last year going, I'm going to get a Bible reading plan, I'm going to read my Bible and out the window. Or many people said, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to put some time aside each day and I'm just going to spend, uh, even if it's just 10 minutes, just quiet with God, just quiet myself and just listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God, commit my, pray for my, uh, my husband and my wife and my kids. I'm going to pray for my work colleagues or whatever. Uh, but, you know, two months in... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna to pray for my, my workmates who don't know God because I believe in the power of prayer and I believe that, that God can take the blinders off and I'm going to pray for And then you prayed for about a week, then one of them trod on your toe or used your pen at your desk and didn't put it back and now you hate them and you stop praying for them. <laughs> huh? How many of you started that year, 2021, with all these grandiose ideas of what we, what we were going to achieve and what we were going to do and what we were going to be consistent on, but you've landed the 31st of December and looked back and gone, I'm just going to have to recycle last year's resolutions again, which people do again and again and again and again. We recycled resolutions before we ever recycled plastic. We've been doing it for a long, long time. You know one of the problems? It's hard to be consistent if you don't have expectation if you don't have expectation. If I'm, expecting God, if I'm expecting God to speak to me through the pages of this book, I'll get consistent in the Word of God. Amen? If I'm expecting to encounter the Holy Spirit when I gather with you people, I'll get consistent in gathering on a Sunday. If, I, if, I, if I'm expecting to hear from God, if I'm expecting that, that God's going to open his ears up to me when I pray, and if I'm expecting answers and outcomes to my prayers, if I'm expecting that, I'll find consistency in prayer. I can't make consistency happen in my life apart from expectation. And what I want to encourage us all this year is to stir up that level of expectation. You know, I'll finish with this. I've got a, I used to have a car. Anyone know a, a Triumph 2000? You know a Triumph 2000? Anyone else have a, a yeah? There, there was tons of them floating around Ballina back when I got my license. Uh, and so my dad, for $100, bought me a Triumph 2000. $100. I mean, I wish I still had it. It'd be worth a mint. But anyway, it had a couple of little problems with it. Um, one of which was a radiator that held enough water for me to go about 1.8 kilometres at a time. Yeah, not bad, eh? I could go about 1.8 k's and then the needle would go up. I'd have to pull over, pop the bonnet, take the cap off while the engine was still running, put another couple of litres of water in it, put the cap down, drive for about another 1.8 to 2 k's. I'd see the, I'd pull over and I just had this system going with this particular car. You know, I, I did a trip to Brisbane. I did a trip to Brisbane by stopping every 1.8 kilometres and putting water in the radiator of this car and then getting back in and going another 1.82 k's. The needle would go up. I'd pull over quickly, pop the bonnet, put some more water in, and I consistently stopped and consistently topped up the bottle, consistently put water in that thing, and that car got me all the way from Ballina to Brisbane by consistently topping it up with water. And here's the thing. 
If you want to get your vehicle, yourself, to the destination that you know you need to go to, you've got to get consistent with stopping and topping yourself up with the water of God's Word, with the water of the Holy Spirit, with the water of prayer, with the water of gathering with other believers. You are not going to get to the place that you need to get to if you don't develop consistency in your life. And you'll never develop consistency so long as you don't expect anything from God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Paul the Apostle writes this. After going on and talking about, he's actually praying for the church and he prays these outrageous things for the church. I mean, you should just go and read it. It's just bigger, it gets bigger than Ben-Hur as he goes on and prays these things that God wants to reveal to the church in Ephesus and so on. And right at the end of it, he says this. He says, and now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could possibly ask or you could possibly think. That's the God I'm talking about today. I don't know about you, but I can ask some pretty outrageous things. How many of you asked for something outrageous for Christmas? I can ask for some pretty outrageous things. My ask, when it gets into gear, I can ask for big things. My brain, sometimes my brain, it's like a trip to Disneyland. There's so much going on up there. If I let you in there, it'd be frightening. But yet Paul says, I don't care what you can think, you're not going to think big enough compared to what God is actually able to do. I don't care what you can ask. I don't care what you can call out for. You'll never be able to ask for anything that's outside the reach of God. That That's the God that we're talking about. That's the God that we're looking forward to in 2022. That's the God I'm looking forward to in 2022. And I hope and pray that that's the God that you're looking forward to in 2022. And before somebody jumps on me and says, oh yeah, Alan, but it says to him, who is able to do it. He doesn't say he will do it. I know it doesn't say he will do it. It says he's able to do it. But here's the thing. I know that the Tigers are probably not going to win a game of football, but I still pay for a ticket. I still go to the game. I still get excited. I still expect something to happen. I still buy their jerseys. I still watch the highlights. If you're a POM, you're still going to pay for tickets to go to the fourth test, even though you know they're not going to win, but you're going to turn up because you're going to be expecting something to happen. So don't jump on the, oh, he didn't promise. I don't care what God didn't promise. God gives me a sniff for something. I'm going to run after it. God gives me a hint that something's possible. I'm going after it. And if it doesn't happen, that's okay. That's up to him. But I'm not going to sit back and be passive and wait and get to the end of my days and realize I've pitched my tent in the wrong place. I was never meant to stay here. I was meant to move on. In 2022, in 2022, can I encourage you? Can I encourage every one of you, get that verse, Ephesians 3.20, go home, get your Bible out and just sit there and just do what the, old, do what the ancients used to do. You know, when the, when the Old Testament talks about meditation, you know what they used to do? They used to take a passage or something and they would murmur it softly under their, under their breath while they just sat there. And sometimes they just gently rock back and forth. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all they can ask or think. Now to him, to him who's able to do. And they would just repeat it over and over and slow it down until that word got in them, until that word became a part of who they were. That, that's my verse for 2022. That's what I'm hanging on to. And I believe in faith that 2022 is going to be a great year for those who raise their level of expectation and run after all that God has for them. Amen? And I hope and pray that that's you. And if you're here and you haven't committed your life to Jesus, that's okay. Can I encourage you this year as well? Hey, let go of 2020. Let go of 2021. Don't don't buy into all the stuff that you might be hearing on the media. I'm not saying be stupid. What I'm saying is this. At some point, you're going to have to pick yourself up just like these guys did and start moving forward again in life. And I hope and pray that you make the decision as well today that you're going to do that. You're going to move forward because God's got good things for you, whether you realize it or not. And he's patient and gracious and he'll wait. And he'll keep chipping away and he'll keep revealing himself to you because he loves you. So Father, I want to thank you for today, God. I want to thank you for the opportunity to gather in this place. Lord God, for those that that couldn't make it today, Father, we pray a blessing on them. Lord, whatever they're doing, wherever they are, God, I just pray that you would be, uh, Father, speaking faith and expectation into their hearts as well at this time, God. That, uh, Father, that they would, uh, Lord, be, be excited about the future, excited about what you have, God, for them individually, Lord. God, we have one shot at life. That's it, one crack. We don't get a second go. And uh, Father, we want it to count. We want to make a difference for the kingdom of God. 
And Father, for each person in this room, I just pray as we get up, we leave this place today, God, don't let us just move on to the next thing. But God, I do pray that, Father, we would think about what, where is our expectation at really? Who is God? What do we think about God? What do we think he thinks of us? What, what, what do we think he's got in store for us? What possibilities are out there? in 2022 and Lord as we leave this place too let every person that knows you God everybody that's bowed their knee to you surrendered to you God I pray that each of those people Father in the next seven days would you give us a chance to tell somebody about you God there's people out there in our community that do not know you that are not interested in you that don't realise you died for them don't realise you love them God there are people in our community that have had really bad experiences with the church they've had really bad experiences with religion Lord there's a lot of people out there And Father, I pray for each person in here, God, give us the chance to meet one of them this week and give us the chance to share something about the goodness of God with them, share something about the love of God, share something about the sacrifice of Jesus with them. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys. Uh, Tea and coffee next door. Don't feel like you've got to run off. Grab a tea, grab a coffee, uh, chat amongst yourselves. You can go if you want. It's up to you.